Good evening, everybody. I am Minister Marcus. Welcome to the Maximize Your Life Bible Study. What I do on Wednesday nights is I try to give uh, uh, those of us who are trying to live our lives in a positive way, in a Christian way, or in just a good, wholesome way. Uh, uh, I try to give us something to keep us encouraged, um, to give us things to think about, different perspectives. Um, and I do it from a biblical uh, base and foundation. And so we're going to go right into it. This month, we are in the book of Ruth. We take a new book every month and we're going through the entire Bible with our Wednesday night Bible studies. And this month we are in Ruth. Last week was a great lesson. I'm not going to rehash that. I will bring you up. Um, but if you want to know um, the initial, the introduction of the story and the different things that we can glean, the truth that we got from that, you could definitely go to last week's lesson. But tonight we're going to Ruth chapter two. All right, and we're going to read only three verses. Um, verse number 10 through 13. And I'm using Big Green tonight. I love Big Green. Big Green is a, a New Living Translation. And uh, it's a good uh, Bible to read just to get a good, solid understanding. If you want to read it, it reads like a story somewhat. And so let's just dive right in. Ruth chapter 2, verse 10 through 13. Ruth fell at his feet. As a matter of fact, let's go back to verse number 8. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. Stay right behind the women working in my field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to bother you. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. Why are you being so kind to me? She asked. I'm only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied. But I also know about the love and kindness you have shown your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother in your own land to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for the love you have shown. I hope I continue to please you, sir, she replied. You have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I am not as worthy as your workers. Verse 14, at lunchtime, Boaz called to her, come over here and help yourself to some of our food. You can dip your bread in the wine if you like. So she sat with, her, with his harvesters and Boaz gave her food more than she could eat. All right, and so tonight, as you know, Wednesday nights, uh, it's not real structured, but I, I try to pull out some things from the lesson that we can learn. And tonight I got three things for you. And for those of you who have been going along with the story, you know that Ruth is the um, daughter-in-law of Naomi who moved to Moab with her husband named Elimelech. Elimelech has died 10 years later after her sons married two Moabite women her sons died, and Ruth is one of the women who her son Malon married. All right, and so at this point in the story, um, there's they, um, they have returned from Moab. So after the men died, they returned from Moab. The other lady that her son married went back to Moab. Ruth chose to stay with Naomi. It's a great story. It's a great read, a great lesson in chapter one. Uh, I'm going to put the link uh, on our YouTube channel so you can go back to that and catch that before you go deeper into this one. But here in chapter two, Ruth and Naomi have come back to Bethlehem. And it, it, as, at the beginning of chapter two, you'll see where Ruth decides to go and find a place to work. And I love these stories, especially this one, because God is not directly highlighted or mentioned in the story, but it does show you a lot of the various characteristics of the people in the story. And one of the characteristics that we see about Ruth at the beginning of chapter two is it shows that Ruth was not a lazy woman. Ruth was not lazy. She could have used many excuses, but instead she chose to get up and go searching for what they needed to survive, right? And I'm diving right in here to my number one. And my number one is, we as Christians, we as people who are good from the inside have to learn what it means to get up 
and go get it. So that's my number one say, I got to get up and go get it. And I believe that this particular lesson right here, this particular part in the story is a great lesson for us because most often people stop at the praying and asking God for things. We know how to pray for stuff. We know how to ask for stuff. But here's what I want you to understand. And, and, it, and it is a principle in scripture that Jesus teaches. He says, ask, seek, and knock. The reality of life is, is that some blessings require you to do more than just ask. Some blessings require you to do more than just pray, but you have to seek them out. My granddaddy used to say it this way. You can pray for a job, but until you go put in the application, you will never get a job. And I want that to sink in, that you can pray for a job all day. You can pray for a job all night. You can go to church and you can shout about getting a job, but until you go searching for the job, you will never find it. And I think it's significant because it shows us that God does not bring every opportunity to your door, but there are some things in life that requires you to go after them. There are some blessings that God wants you to have that will, that will require you to get up and go after them. There are some things in your life that you will have to get up, put forth some effort and go after. And I think it's real significant because she was not lazy. And a lot of us Christians, we know how to pray, but we don't know how to put forth the effort, right? We know how to shout, but we don't know how to get up and go after those things that God said that we could have. What if I told you that God wanted you to be successful, but you had to go find it? What if I told you that your million dollars was out there and God wanted to give it to you, but you had to get up to go find it? What if I told you that your wife was out there, but you got to go find it? Your husband was out there, but you got to put yourself in a place where he can see you. And I want you to hear me that your success, your blessing is waiting for you to find it. And I want that to sink in because a lot of times we think that God is going to send a check to our doorstep. We think that God is going to put it in the mailbox, that God is going to put a diamond ring in the mailbox, that God is going to send you a husband to your doorstep. He worked for UPS. No, no, no. God is not going to cause your husband to have a flat tire in front of your house and you go outside and he right there. But I want I want you to understand that some blessings will require you to go after him. God says it's yours, but I'm not going to bring it to you. You have to get up and go get it. And I love what he does with Elijah. He does it with Elijah in, in the Old Testament. He says, Elijah, I want you to stay alive in the famine, right? But your provision is not here. You got to go by the brook and the brook, you will be able to drink from the brook. But I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. And I want you to understand that there are times that you have to position yourself in the place that the blessing is, is that God will not send the blessing to you, but you have got to get up and put yourself in the place where the blessing is and we've got to stop expecting things to come to us. I want you to I want you to hear me when I say that. Stop expecting things to come to you and you decide to get up and go get what God said that you could have. And I think it's so significant and I think it's so important that we understand sometimes people come, they cry, they cry, they cry, they cry until God finally responds with what are you going to do? about? I hear you crying, but what are you going to do about it? Are you going to get up and go after better for your life? Naomi and Ruth have come back to Bethlehem. Their husbands have died and Ruth decides that she's going to go after some resources. And I wonder if that's you. I wonder if you think that you're sitting back waiting on God, but I wonder if God is actually sitting back waiting on you to get up and go after it. Number one, get up and go after it. It's not going to find you on the couch, but you've got to get up off the couch. It's not going to find you on the game, but you got to get up off the game. It's not going to find you watching Netflix, but you got to get up and you got to move on it. Come on, say, I got to get up and go get it. Get up and go get it. And here's what I love about the text. When she goes searching the story, when she goes searching, she happens to find herself in a field that belongs to a relative of Naomi's deceased husband. Now, I want you to get that. 
Ruth decides to get up. And as she's searching, she happens to find herself looking for a place to work. She happens to find herself in a field that belongs to a man named Boaz, who was kin to Naomi's deceased husband. And I want you to get this, that verse one introduces us to Boaz to show us that what's going to happen in verse three does not happen because Naomi told Ruth where to go. And I want to stress that, right? Because we're going to number two. I want to stress that it shows that Naomi does not tell Ruth where to go. She just says, Ruth, go try to find something. And I want you to get this, that at this point in the story, you start to recognize that this is not a coincidence. And that's my number two. I want you to say this, say, where I am in my life is not a coincidence. What happened in your life is not a coincidence. What you're dealing with in your life is not a coincidence. COVID happened in 2020. That's not a coincidence. Where we are in 2021, this is not a coincidence. And I want you to understand that, that sometimes you won't see God's hand in your story until you get further down the road. Get it in chapter one. All we saw was sadness. All we saw was heartache. All we saw was loss. All we saw was bitterness. All we saw was depression. But it's not until chapter two that you start to realize that nothing happens for no reason, that everything has a reason and everything has a purpose, that this is not a coincidence. It is not a coincidence. At this point in the story, we start to realize that even though God has not been directly mentioned, that we can now see him at work somewhere in the story. And I want you to I want to encourage you with that tonight, because sometimes you won't see God's hand while you're dealing with it. It's frustrating. It may be sad. It may be depressing. It may be uncomfortable. You may not feel God's presence anywhere, but I want you to understand what I say, that sometimes you it may take time before you see that God is up to something. I know it hurt, right? But God is up to something. This is not a coincidence. Your pain is not in vain. This is not a coincidence. I want you to hear me when I say that, that now we see God at work somewhere in the story. And I want you to get this that Naomi, I mean, that Ruth decides to go after it. And while she's going after it, she finds herself in the place. And we now can see that God has been ordering her steps. We now see that God has been orchestrating the entire situation. We don't know what exactly, we don't know how it's going to come together. But at this point in the story, we recognize that what's happening in verse number three is not a coincidence. And I want you to hear me when I say this, that God has a way of pointing you in the right direction and putting you on the right path. And this is why the text says, when you seek, you will find, because once you start putting forth the effort, God has a way of pointing you in the right direction and putting you on the right path. Only God can put you in the right place at the right time so that you can connect with the right person. And I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that the things that have happened in your life have not been by coincidence, but it has have been God working behind the scenes to orchestrate you into a different arena. And sometimes it's not until your time of reflection that you start to think back and you realize that if that hadn't happened, then this wouldn't have happened. And if that hadn't happened, then this wouldn't have happened. And then you start to realize that it has been God orchestrating your life in order to bring you to a new mindset, in order to bring you to a new level of maturity, in order to bring you to to a different connection, to connect you to someone who's going to help you grow in business, to help you connect you to someone who's going to help grow your church is going to be a blessing to your life. And I want you to understand that this is not a coincidence. If God has moved one thing, it's because he's about to send you another thing. This is not a coincidence that you're dealing with what you're dealing with. But God is at work behind the scenes. And I want that to encourage you to say, this is not a coincidence. God is at work in your life. Say that. I want you to say this. Say, this is not a coincidence. God is at work in my life. This is not a coincidence. But God is orchestrating the events of your life to bring you to your next 
next level. All right. And so that's my number two. This is not a coincidence. I don't know what's happening, but I know God is doing something. I don't know where it's going to happen or how, but I just know that God is doing something. You just got to know right now, no, no matter what you're dealing with, it's not coincidence, but God is working something. It's not a God is orchestrating. All right. And so, so now here, here, what we find is, what she says is she finds herself in the field of Boaz and we're going to hit it more next week, but I'm almost, I'm almost done. And then she finds herself working in Boaz's field. And this is what we picked up in the tech. I mean, the story in chapter two, because what happens is, is that Boaz all of a sudden shows favor to Ruth. He says to her, I want you to glean behind my men. I've told the men not to bother you. I've left some extra stuff on for you to go and get. I told the men, you know, while they, while they, you know, while they, um, a gleam and while they picking the harvest to leave some for you, just what it does is she's found favor in the eyes of Boaz. And here's what I love about the story. And we go on to number three. She says to him, what have I done that gave me favor in your eyes. And the King James Version says, may the Lord recompense thy work. And I know King James, I'm reading it so that you can understand it, but I understand it in King James and what Boaz says to her, he says, may the Lord recompense thy work. In other words, may God bless you for being good the way let me let me say that. May God bless you for being good to Naomi the way that you have been. In other words, may God cause the goodness that you have put out to Naomi to come back to you. In other words, that's what it said. I want you to hear me when I say this. That everything, let me let me encourage you tonight before we go offline. And we go to number three. Everything that you have done from the genuineness of your heart, God will give it back to you. And that's my number three. Come on, say God will give it back to me. I want you to understand that everything that you have done from the kindness and genuineness and pure intentions of your heart, God will fix it to where it comes back to you. And I want you to understand that, that God will give it back to you. Recognize that her blessing did not come from Naomi, but it did come because of Naomi. And I want you to hear me when I say this, that sometimes we get annoyed. Sometimes we get frustrated when we do good to people that do, don't do us good in return. But I want you to understand that God may not always bring your blessing out of the place that he used you to be a blessing in. Get that. There's some people who you did good that God may not bring that good back from them. But I want you to hear me when I say this, that God will fix it so that the good will come back to you. And this is why I always encourage people. I tell them to stop getting mad at people who don't do you as right as you have done them. Stop getting mad at people who haven't done you as good as you have done them. But you serve a God who is able to make your good. This is why it says with the same as you may give and it shall be given unto you. And then at the end of that verse, it says, will men give into your bosom? Not the man that you gave it to. But men will give it back to you. In other words, that it will come back, but it may not come back from the place that you expect it to come back. But I want you to hear me that God will make it come from somewhere else. And I want you to hear me say this to yourself. Say, God is going to give it back to me. I know they did you bad while you did them good, but God is going to return your good. When it come, I want you to hear me. He says, may the Lord bless you for being good to Naomi. And here's what I love about it, that he, he is good to God is good to Ruth through Boaz even though Ruth was good to Naomi. And how many of you understand this principle about God? And in the word we say like this, what goes around comes around. But in God's eyes, it says with the same measure that you meet, it will be measured to you again. In other words, what you put out is what's come on, is what's going to come back to you. And I, I, I always encourage people that you cannot stop doing what is right or doing what is good because somebody has done you wrong. Don't go back and try to repay them evil, but trust that God is going to give it back to you. Only God can make your blessing come from, don't you? you know that you serve a God that can use anybody to bless you. God can use anything to bless you. God can create any situation to turn around to work in your favor. And I love it that God will bless you simply because you have been a blessing to somebody else. Simply because 
You have been a blessing to somebody else because you have done good to somebody else. God will have somebody come back and do good to you. I remember when I first started living this principle and I'm almost done. I got about 30 seconds. When I first started living this principle, I started to realize that God will cause people. Somebody just bought my groceries in line just for nothing. And he brought back to my remembrance with the same measure that you meet. It's because you've been given to the homeless. It's because you've been given your good works. It's because you've been working for free and order to bless other people's lives. And this is God's way of showing you that he sees the good that you do and God will give it back. Come on to you. And that's my number three. That's all I got for you tonight. I hope something that I said was a great encouragement to you. I come on every single Wednesday night just for you, just to encourage your heart, just to keep you strengthened in your faith, to remind you not to get weary in well-doing, but in due season, you will weep. If you do not faint, I encourage you to subscribe to our channel. Look, it's for free. All you got to do is hit the subscribe button. And, and every video that we load up for your encouragement in the mornings, you'll be able to catch that on your way to work. Just pop your earbuds in. And as you ride, listen to it. Visit our website www.thegodmovement.com and that's all I got for you guys tonight so you guys have a blessed one and you guys be blessed I will see y'all next Wednesday night at 8.30